they had the Sarah. The Hope we vote yes on that. It's gonna be awkward. <laughs> <laughs> All right, as we always do, uh, before we call this meeting to order, if you please join us in a prayer. Lord, we thank you for today and this time together. We thank you for the beauty of spring and the opportunities to be outside. We ask for your guidance this evening. Guide us to make decisions that will bless our schools. Please be with us as we look toward the last weeks of school and help us to continue to, to do all we can to keep everyone safe and, safe and healthy. Be with those that are struggling and give them peace. Thank you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the uh, April Franklin School Board meeting. I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, we do have uh, a special guest here this evening. I know we're waiting on him to show up, but uh, we want to move this item up into the agenda. So um, we'll give just a minute here. And, uh... Oh, I think that might be. Okay. All right. So, Mr. Doty, if you would come up to the microphone and let the folks know our intent tonight. Yes. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Lamb. As, as you recall, at the previous meeting in March, uh, I proposed that we honor uh, Mr. Noel Hemminger for his years of service and dedication to this community at, at large and, and Franklin Community Schools and the athletic department by naming the athletic complex uh, in, in, in his honor, uh, the Noel Hemminger Athletic Complex. So that was proposed and I hope uh, we're prepared to, to vote on that. I have Mr. Hemminger here with me tonight and several of his family members. So I um, would like to just ask Mr. Hemminger to, to come up and, and just say a couple words. I don't know if it's appropriate now or if there needs to be a vote now. We, let's, let's take the vote first, okay. and then we'll have Mr. Hemminger come up. All right, Is that fair? Good. So I'd like to make a motion to the board that we approve naming of the facilities uh, to Mr. Hemminger. I'll second. Thank you. Christy, how do you vote? I vote yes. Becky? Yes. Ryan? Yes. And I vote yes. Thank you. That motion passes. this time I'd like to have Mr. Hemminger come up and, and just maybe say a couple words and, and he can introduce his family that's here with him in support. Thank you, sir. I'm sorry. I'm really embarrassed. I couldn't find my keys and I thought, <laughs> oh my gosh, not tonight, uh, but thank you. Um, Billy called me last fall and um, basically said, I need to talk to you about a few things in the athletic department. And I said, sure, I'll be glad to. And uh, we chatted for a while, and the last thing he mentioned was um, there's a proposal of this sort of naming the facility, outdoor facilities in your name. And at that point, I lost it. I was overwhelmed, um, shocked, if you will. So it took me a few minutes to um, try to compose myself. As Billy mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I was very emotional. After 37 years here, you look back and think about um, a flashback of me playing sports, playing four sports at the high school, teaching, coaching, and then athletic director up here at the new school, well, well both. So it, again, it was very overwhelming. I, I tried to put myself back together, and uh, I think I eventually did, but it was rather embarrassing at a restaurant and, uh, <laughs> to do that. But anyway, I want to, first of all, thank my family. Uh, I'll probably forget who's here and who isn't here, but uh, I, have an, I have three daughters, uh, Allison Seaver over here. Her husband, Dr. Mike Seaver, is back here. Um, their kids, J.D. Seaver, Jenna Seaver, is Addie here? She's at practice probably. Uh, Stephanie Potter, my other, my middle daughter, is a teacher in Illinois, and of course couldn't come down. And, uh, I understand that, but she 
she called me last night and uh, wished me the best. So I appreciate what she's done for, for me too. Uh, and then Jill Bland, my youngest is right here. Her husband, Craig Bland, Karsten Bland, Cooper Bland, Noel Bland. My nephew behind me um, is Kyle Hemminger and his wife, Val. But this, this is a tremendous honor, not just for me, but more so for my family. Um, they've been behind me all the way, and there's one person, um, and of course, my wife. So I thank you, Dr. Clendenning, the board members, um, the Athletic Council, who was part of this, Steve A. House, the high school principal, and athletic director Billy Doty. It's a tremendous honor, and I thank you. Yep, Robin is right here. So yeah, picture. Yep. yep. If I could just add one thing, uh, sometime uh, late July, early August time frame, we'll, we'll send this out, but we'll have a, uh, a ceremony out at the uh, main gates to the, to the athletic complex where we'll unveil uh, the, the new name up there and invite all of our community and obviously uh, the Hemminger family at large. So look for that coming out late July. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Lamb, for doing that. that was Absolutely. It's been a long time since we've had a large group vacate so quickly. <laughs> you know, kind of bring us back to the old days. <laughs> Look at that. That's good. All right. We'll get back to the uh, agenda now and uh, for public comments. So if there's anyone here in the room that has comments on the agenda this evening, please step up to the microphone. And you'll have two minutes. All right, Mrs. Betts, do we have anybody on the line? Okay, so we'll open it up for uh, board comments. Okay, we'll go to our uh, committees, the Athletic Council. We had our event this evening, no other updates. Central Nine. Um, <clears throat> they um, will be finalizing their um, plans for the expansion project. And um, they're going to be bringing that to the May C9 board meeting to where then we'll br be bringing it to the June school board meeting. Okay. Do so. we know, do we ever figure out what it takes to pass or fail that? Yes. So 75% um, of the nine school boards. So, um, like if we said no, but the other one said yes, it would still go through. So 75% have to approve it within their school, you know, going forward.
All right, thank you. Uh, collective bargaining. No updates for me. David, have you got? The only thing we, uh, we have nothing, but it, we're getting ready to enter into the collective bargaining season, so we do need to meet with uh, you and Mr. Wirtz, with uh, Mrs. Gross and I, as we talk about where we're headed. Um, also, with regard to the ESRA two money, and then you'll hear more about that in just a little bit. Thank you. Our communications? We haven't met. Legislative. Legislative Council, just a couple things. The General Assembly is winding up. They're, they are uh, through the bills passing houses. Now they're going through and fine-tuning them. One that did pass on to the governor's desk that's going to impact schools, and that is with regard to teachers' unions. Uh, they must declare every year now if they're going to stay in the union or not. Um, I, I talked to our president, Mr. Harris, earlier today. They're not sure how that has to go about, if it's electronic confirmation or paper or what, but they'll get back to us, and then they'll get that to Ms. Gross as we continue with payroll deduction. But that's the, the biggest one. Obviously, the general budget is continuing to move forward. There was a major change coming out of the Senate with regard to school funding, so we'll see how that gets reconciled, but uh, we'll have more information in May. Thank you. Uh, mental health. Um, they, we had our meeting. Um, there is some discussion of a third therapy dog. Yep. Um, so more news to come on that. But we did um, we did go ahead and put a deposit down and and sign and go ahead and get on the wait list just because it is such a long wait, mm -hmm. um, and we're no obligation to, you know, wait or mm -hmm. anything like that um, and also they're interviewing for um, a second social emotional learning interventionist here at the high school they really see a need for that so they have been doing some interviews for that and then also we have 51 participants um, going to a youth mental health first aid training mm. um, um, in April May and June and I'll be participating in that so great it's cool yeah Mr. Lamb, if I could, I just want to give you a highlight of how Millie impacts life. And Millie is here tonight. But this came to us late today, and it's called Millie Mail. And Millie and Hero both have mail service in their schools. So Millie Mail says, Dear Millie, I love that you always help me feel better, and you always make me smile, and you always make school a better place. I love you, Millie, like a lot. <laughs> love, Alex. And then another thing that happened late today a first grader's dog died last week. So Millie actually wrote the first grader a letter to help them get through kind of the early grief period on, on dying. So they are making a huge difference in our schools, both with kids and adults. So just a, just a small example of Millie Mail that comes through on that. Thanks for sharing that. Uh, Brian is not here for music, so RDC? Uh, Nothing to report. Okay, superintendents council. We are meeting Wednesday, um, and I believe it's at the middle school. Is that right, Mrs. Betts? Did you find out for sure? It's going to be at Custer Baker. Oh, it's at Custer Baker. Okay, we're going to be at Custer Baker, and we are looking at the redistricting maps. Uh, we're going to have them blown up, and we're going to have sticky notes. We're going to have people do a gallery walk through to continue to solidify the strategic plan, and then after we do the gallery walk on strategic plan. The last thing we're going to do before we bring them back to the board, we're going to go, we're going to divide up PTOs and we're going to go to the respective schools with the finalized plan that we're going to recommend to you so that we get a lot of community input now that COVID is kind of waning and we can be back in person. So that will be this Wednesday at 630 at Custer Baker Intermediate. And we're going to probably meet in the main foyer uh, area as we do the gallery walk because it's big enough and spread out enough that we can get a lot, some people in there. But it wouldn't be till August 2022. August right? of 22. We still have a year out. So we still have a lot of opportunities for comments, et cetera. That's why we're going to PTOs next time. All right. Last is uh, diversity and inclusion. I don't think we've met since the last board meeting, but if you want to bring back some more kids. We had a planning meeting last week with Dr. Aziz, and we'll have a meeting actually this Thursday. So for our next phase. And I believe she meets with this group with the board in May, prior to the May board meeting. We also started scheduling focus groups. 
So she will be with our high school students on May 10th. It looks like on May 12th, she'll be with CBIS students, both fifth graders and sixth graders, and then May 18th with our seventh and eighth graders. So we're starting with student focus groups. As we do more work with her, uh, we'll move into some of the adult focus groups. But uh, so we're getting those started, so that's exciting. How are you um, filling the focus groups? We've actually asked the buildings to manage that process. I know uh, some of the buildings I've talked to, Ryan, the teachers are engaged with helping select students for that process. Cool. Thank you. And there have been a few times when Dr. Clendenning uh, in invokes his right to invite p people to the <laughs> conversation where we've had people come up and, and express a desire and we're like, come, come talk to the in focus group. So we, that's been also part. Mm -hmm. All right, any other comments? Moving to the next item on the agenda is recognition. And the first one is under collaboration. Yes, good evening everyone. We have an exciting list this evening. We will start with our guiding principle of collaboration and then move on to individual student growth. Collaboration. Our Director of Health Services, many of you know, Amanda Martin, she received the hardworking Hoosier Award for playing an integral part in the planning and implementation of safety procedures for our school district as well as our community. Amanda continues or communicates regularly with employees, students, families, and various other community members in an effort to keep Franklin schools in the community safe, especially during the COVID-19 era. The hardworking Hoosier Award was presented to Amanda Martin by Representative Michelle Davis. Please join me in congratulating Amanda on her fine work. Individual student growth. Again, congrats to our students, their families, their coaches, teachers. I know in many cases it takes a team. Business Professionals of America. Our BPA students attended state finals through a virtual world this year. Yeah. They had a great performance with four students advancing to nationals. Belma Duherick placed third individually. She will be advancing to nationals on presentation management. The team of Lauren Sandrock, Megan Thompson, and Carly Woodward will be advancing to nationals as a group on financial analyst. The other state final participants were Abigail Baldwin, Carly Hargis, Haley Doddridge, Madison Quiggins, Corinne Daymeyer, Allison Lacey, Margaret Woods, Marissa Hoban, Lauren Holcroft, Danielle Hensley, Damon Dickey, Kendall Myrise, Emma Pietras, and Morgan Harvey. Congratulations, job well done to those students. ISMA Solo and Ensemble. Franklin Community High School band students recently participated in the Indiana State School Music Association, ISMA, Virtual Instrumental Solo and Ensemble Contest. This year, the students submitted recordings of their performances for evaluation. Congratulations to the following students for receiving state recognition. Gold rating with distinction, Zoe Catlin, Liam Clark, Gavin Fisk, Andy Haddock, and Morgan Harvey. Gold rating went to the following students, Riley Burke, Zoe Catlin, Liam Clark, Luke Fisher, Melina Fisk, Reese Fritz, Sean Greider, Andy Haddock, Morgan Harvey, Emily Jackson, Olivia Nightlinger, Zane Kahn, Gavin McKay, Michael Maudlid, Derek Muth, Nolan Shepard, Kylie Stahl, Samantha Thurman, Dominic Armstrong, Ethan Bergman, Will Campbell, Dylan Clark, Bailey Hill, Madeline Cope, and Maddie Stillebauer. Silver ratings went to the following, Michael Clark, Jennifer McCoplin, and Gabe Swigert. Congratulations, great job team at the solo, ISMA solo and ensemble. Indoor percussion. Congratulations to the Franklin Community Indoor Percussion Ensemble on earning a second place silver medal at the Indoor Percussion Association State Finals. 
their score was one-tenth, one-tenth behind the gold medal winner. Dakota Ankney, Dominic Armstrong, Jack Baker, Brian Barger, Joe Bergener, Riley Burke, Will Cantwell, Dylan Clark, Luke Fouracre, Ruthie Fouracre, Reese Fritz, Ethan Hacker, Katie Harris, Ruthanna Hatman, Aaron Hickey, Zayden Hoffman, Zach Holbrook, Cole Hufford, Michaela Hunsinger, Brody Joyce, Emily Jackson, Alex Julbert, Logan Justice, Zane Khan, Sam Loudon, Emma Maxey, Jennifer McCoplin, Gavin McKay, Naomi Mills, Piper Miller, Hannah Nix, Noen Finney, Noah Finney, apology, Olivia Rickelman, Kirsten Spears, Maddie Stillabauer, Bella Street, Jacob Wilson, and Alec Alexis Wright. Congratulations to all of our musicians. Well done. Central Nine Student of the Month. Each month, C9 asks their instructors to identify students who've shown the character and work ethic to be named Student of the Month in each of their programs. For the months of March and April, we would like to recognize the following students. Alexandra Duff in Culinary Arts. Olivia Doobie in Health Science One. Colton Leeper in HVAC. Kyla Rather in Culinary Arts. Nathan Roal in Auto Service Tech. Shelby Featherston in Project Lead the Way Biomedical Science. And Brooklyn Whitlock in Work-Based Learning. Please join me in congratulating the fantastic work and frankly creativity and innovation shown during COVID. Great job students, let's congratulate them. All right, and I have the privilege this month to recognize and share a proclamation and honor recognition of our FCS classroom assistants our clerical staff, the information service department, our central office staff, and all the other members of the Franklin Community Schools classified staff. This group of individuals continue to serve the students of Franklin Community Schools selfishly and remain flexible and accommodating throughout the many changes brought upon them by the COVID-19 uh, efforts. This staff also was very dedicated and valued and are valued uh, at the Franklin Community Schools. So therefore, April the 13th will be the certified staff day, which is tomorrow, uh, and will be recognized by, with a lunch for that group. Dr. Clendenning, if you would share the details of that lunch. So this, this time we're honoring all uh, members with a gift certificate from McAllister's Deli that will allow them to pick up their lunch uh, on us. So that's a special treat and we just want to thank, thank Natalie for arranging all the food trucks at McAllister's over the last four months. I love that we're doing this stuff. It's so cool. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. We'll move into the uh, next uh, section, which is the consent agenda. Another consent agenda, there's one item that uh, I'd like to bring up, uh, which is the cybersecurity insurance. And just for the rest of the board to highlight the importance of, of this policy, as so many schools have been hit with the cyber attacks, with the ransomware, mm -hmm. that this will help us prepare to offset for that. So thanks, Matt, for getting that together for us. And Mr. Lamb, uh, I do want to note one change to the elementary handbook uh, proposed change list. We've added a small description about our responsibility as educators to report to Department of Child Services. So you will see that addition with regards to DCS on that list of changes. Okay, thank you. And Mr. Lamb, um, the surety bonds, um, those are the additional 
bonds that um, we needed to revise as a result of the ECA audit. Okay. And also in personnel, we want to thank Mr. Uh, Brad Dickey for coaching uh, basketball the past several years as, as he continues to, to move forward in, in, in uh, his journey. And then uh, the job is posted in Mr. Doty, uh, Mr. Ahouse, are continuing that search. So we want to say thank you to, to Coach Dickey for that. Absolutely. Um, also, just want to highlight a few of the COVID-19 changes uh, that are before us. As we move forward, um, you know, obviously the virus is not going away, but we are seeing uh, some positive trends in, in that. And some of the things we're going to request is that for recess in the month of May, that kids be able to go out by grade level, not just by class as we move forward. That'll also free up the teachers because right now they're taking their own class out. So that's in addition with the uh, number of people getting the opportunity to get vaccinated, um, we're requesting that uh, during the month of May, PLC meetings, which are one Wednesday a month, would be able to meet in a room uh, and if they can socially distance themselves apart, they could take their mask off. Otherwise, they keep their mask on and move forward. And if they're not comfortable, they can keep their mask on. We're not going to ask anybody about their vaccine or anything, but just want to give them a chance to get face to face and look at data as we look forward to, to next school year. How many people is that? Uh, the, the largest number would be here at the high school in some of their departments, like English, you know, math, some of those. Um, I want to say 10 um, and, and, and some will be as small as three, you know, in what we're doing. Um, I know I'm forgetting a couple. What else am I on that PLC one or on the COVID? Did we ever talk Athletic about events. Oh, yes. Thank you. Athletic events. Uh, it's one that we, as we go out to, this, to the spring seasons, I talked with Dr. Mormon about all of these, but Dr. Mormon specifically with regard to the athletic events, we're going to, to say that parents must wear their masks into the stadium and or event. When they are sitting down, they can take their mask off because they're with their bubble group anyway. If you go to watch a, a game or a track meet, um, if they are going to the concession stand, they must put their mask back on. And concession stand workers will be wearing masks throughout that time they're in the concession stand. But it allows us a chance to, to get back. Mr. Doty, uh, we were at a baseball game. And, um, you know, I think if we choose not to do this, he's going to end up being the mask police throughout the journey as well as, as that. And I will tell you, um, we do have one area uh, at the middle school. We have 160 participants in track. We will not be able to allow them to have four people come with them at all times because we would exceed the actual mm -hmm. capacity of that half stadium that's required. So we're still limiting that uh, to two people, uh, preferably. And if, and if more people come, then Mr. Harris will look at that. But if every kid brought mom and dad plus a few others, it would fill the stadium because we have so many, which is great. Uh, here at the high school, we should be fine throughout all sporting events, uh, except Bill Self and a couple others that Mr. Doty has to, to monitor on the track side where we have multiple teams coming uh, into the stadium and stands, and he will continue to work on that in the, during the, those events. What about indoor sports? Only thing we have right now is uh, volleyball. Volleyball must continue to wear their mask inside. We did not change that. And that capacity is also at 50%, uh, which, you know, for us, we won't get that in volleyball, but everybody will be able to come to those games. Those are the, the COVID changes that I'm requesting at this time. Any questions or comments? Do we have a sense, I know we're not asking this, but do we have a sense of vaccinations and how easily teachers are getting them and if we're, the people who want them are, are getting them? And yep, the people wanting them are getting them. Uh, I think Amanda said in, in uh, her most recent communication with me today, I think she had, uh, I think over 60%, she thought. And maybe Becky knows, as you guys talk about it in nursing, but I think it's about that. Our survey indicated about 88% said they were interested in getting the vaccine. Um, so anybody now that wants it can get in in a timely manner. You know, we have several sites from adult and child, the hospital, and Com um, Compass Park um, are available. Compass Park is doing Moderna, 
and the hospital is doing Pfizer. So we're getting ample opportunities. Then you can still do Walmart and Meyer and those sites. So um, they are moving through, and if people want them, they can get them. Good. All right. Do I have a motion for the uh, consent agenda? I'll move for approval. Thank you, Christy. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Brian. Christy, how do you vote? Yes. Becky? Yes. Brian? Yes. I vote yes. That passes. We'll move into the uh, superintendent report. Okay, first round of our new financial reports. Um, in looking at the monthly expenditure overview, I'll just highlight a few things. Um, that the dashboard at the top is going to show um, our year-to-date expenses, salaries, and a few of the specific categories. Um, and then you. You have the actual number and then variance to budget. That is what the forecast five tool projects out to the end of the year. So this is saying our year-to-date expenses are 10.7 million and um, forecasting out to be um, 919,000 under budget. So that's favorable, okay? Salaries and benefits is also favorable at um, just a little under a million dollars. Now, the reason for that is um, in 2020, we had three pays in January. We don't have that until April this time, which is why we're, we're showing so far ahead. So eventually that'll catch up after this um, April pay cycle. Purchase surf services, um, we're at 925,000. That variance to budget is unfavorable by $56,000. Um, a few things on that. We've had increased postage this year. We've had a lot of things going out in the mail to parents. Um, we've had increased enrollment in, at, at C9, so that's increased our invoicing there. We've had um, vet bills for um, Hero. We ha he had a couple surgeries that we weren't expecting. Um, and then another one that's, um, that's a little strange, but you can understandable during a pandemic, um, in food services, we've had to prepackage everything. So all these styrofoam containers, um, that has increased our cost in trash removal. So those are just a few things, you know, $56,000, um, I'm not overly concerned about that. And then other expenses, also a little bit um, unfavorable. But we've purchased ahead um, transportation. We've got fuel up until about August. Um, our gas usually runs higher in January through March. And then we've also purchased um, some Chromebooks and other technology that has a long lead time. So um, we've uncovered and um, paid some of those bills ahead of time. So um, if you look at some of the graphs, our historical expenses for the current month, um, we're a little, little behind um, 2020 expenditures. And then if you look at that, that bottom section um, on the right-hand side, the, it shows our historical spending for the last five years. If you look at that salary line, in 2020, we spent 7.1, in 2021, 6.3. And again, that's because of our, our three pay cycle that'll hit next mm. month. So we're right in line with what we were, we were spending last year, um, which COVID hadn't hit at this time last year. So we're, we're in good shape, I think. The next page shows our statements of revenue, expenditures, transfer, and changes in fund balance. So if you, um, if you look on the, the very left-hand side, um, that box just shows um, our comparison to 2020. Again, the, the big difference is in that salary line. Otherwise, we would pretty much be neck and neck with um, last year's spending. You see some red on this um, spreadsheet, which you don't like to see in the financial world, but that is because you know we're spending January through June, and then we get a large payment in property taxes. So your 
the referendum and operations are going to run in the red until we catch that up in June. So that's why you're seeing that. But our fund balances are pretty healthy. And then that bottom graph, that's a great visual because um, as you can see, we're, we're neck and neck with revenues and expenditures up until March. And then at that point, our expenditures exceed revenues. They eventually catch up in June. And that just is a good visual of what our cycle looks like. And then the third page um, shows our projected cash flow. And the two numbers that I really focus on are the, the top left number, the beginning cash balance in January of $10.3 million, and then go down to the very bottom number under um, December projected, which is $10.8 million. So what that's telling you is um, our projected fund balance is about a half a million more than what we started with at the beginning of the year. So you're, you're going to see some red throughout, but in the end, um, we should be able to increase our operating balance at the end of the year. A lot to digest. So, Tina, when we look at the uh, second page, that chart that shows or that you're comparing the revenues to the expenditures, mm -hmm. is that cycle the same in our past years? Yes. Okay. Yes. A little bit um, different. Last year, we started collecting um, monthly payments of property taxes, so it might vary a little bit, but we don't collect a whole lot until June. Right. Okay. I like the new format. Me too. Thank is you. Is this easier for you to generate than the uh, previous files? Yeah, it is. Yeah. We're still running the manual reports behind the scenes just to make sure, but um, everything seems to be in line. Good. This is not uh, really related to what you just said, but when you brought up Hero, I thought about it, and then when Becky's comment about getting a third dog, and maybe this is directed to Miss Kim, I'm not sure exactly, but. I think there is gonna there is a groundswell of support for these dogs, and I think that if we can find a way to fundraise, I don't think that we should that we're gonna have to spend a dollar on these dogs. So I would challenge whoever it is that can take that project and run with it. But people love these animals. If we can do a fundraiser somewhere, I think you're gonna be blown away by people writing checks for these four-legged creatures. Mm -hmm. So it's just my plug that I think that the public will be happy to support uh, these animals. I don't know how to do that. Someone smart me to figure that out, but that's just my thought. Good idea. All right, we'll move into the next item on the agenda, which is our action items. Uh, so I am going to suspend the uh, board meeting and then open up a public hearing for our bus replacement. So Mrs. Gross, if you'd like to go through that. I will. So we have um, posted a revised bus replacement plan in both Gateway and on the Franklin Community Schools website as required by Indiana Code. Um, the reason for a, the revised plan is that we have a 2012 bus that has gone into engine failure. Um, and it's an inherent problem with that particular engine. Um, the estimate for fixing that particular or replacing that engine was $22,000. So we decided, and even with that repair, um, it could have the same thing could happen again. So rather than sinking that money into an unknown, um, we are recommending to go ahead and replace that bus. Um, the, the original plan was to replace three of the 2004 buses, um, but due to this engine failure, we would delay one of the 2004 buses until 2022 and um, replace this 2012 instead. It's also an exception, and you'll see in your packet um, an explanation as to why we um, would be trading this bus in prior to the 12-year mark. Um, so we have explained that reasoning. Um, 
On a side note, we received the VW disbursement just last week of 135,000. So um, we expensed that last year and they were um, a little tardy in getting us our reimbursement. So it kind of worked out nicely because we can use that revenue for, for this um, bus replacement. And then we'll delay the other two, the decision of the other two buses towards the end of the year when we know um, more about our cash flow. Um, so I am asking for approval to um, submit the revised plan to the DLGF on Gateway. Do you have any questions for Tina? I guess the only question I would have, the replacement, does this give us an opportunity to get into um, any of the grant uh, work to natural gas bus, or will it give you the opportunity to get one with seat belts? Correct, yeah. The, the plan would be to get a, another propane bus with seat belts. The propane buses, the eight that we have so far, are working out just like we would project them as far as the savings that we're that's coming from those. Um, they're, the, the numbers numbers are great. If we could have a, a three fourths of our fleet be propane, then, then it would be, we could be saving roughly 3,500 a year plus. So, so they're, they work out great. Okay. Any questions for? Do I have a motion for that item? Uh, Mr. President, yes, sir. Call for any public comment. This is a public hearing as well. Thank you, sir. Has yep. No, that's good call. Mrs. Betts, is there any public comments online? All right. Thank you, Roger. So, with that, do I have a motion for this action item? I'll move for approval. Thank you, Christy. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Ryan. Christy, how do you vote? Yes. Becky? Yes. Ryan? Yes. And I vote yes. That motion passes. So we'll close the uh, public hearing on the bus replacement. Now we'll open a public hearing for the additional appropriations. Again, this is gross. So um, the notice to taxpayers um, for additional appropriation of $250,000 was published in the Daily Journal on April the 1st um, as required by Indiana Code. Um, we are asking for this additional appropriation to um, engage um, some uh, architects, engineers, and specialists um, to create design schematics um, and estimated cost for some of the building improvements that were identified in the feasibility study. Um, so this will include um, roofing, HVAC, masonry, fire protection, renovations, technology upgrades, etc. cetera. Um, let's see. So we are asking for the board's approval on the resolution um, for an additional appropriation. This will go to the DLGF for final approval once the board approves. All right, any questions for Tina on that? Okay. Any public comments or questions? And then Mrs. Betts, anything online? No? And with that, do I have a motion for this action item? I'm not for approval. Thank you. I'll second. Becky, and thank you, Christy. Becky, or Christy, how do you vote? Yes. Becky? Yes. Ryan? Yes. And I vote yes. That motion passes. Okay, with that, we'll close the public hearing on the appropriation, and we'll open back <coughs> up. Hey, Noah. And we'll open back up the uh, school board meeting and now come to the resolution to transfer from rainy day to operations fund. Ms. Gross. Once the DLGF approves that additional appropriation, um, I'm asking for board approval to transfer those funds from rainy day, the rainy day fund to the operations fund in order to um, issue POs and make those expenditures. <coughs> 
Any questions? I have a motion. Move for approval. Thank you, Christy. Do I have a second? A second. Thank you, Ryan. Christy, how do you vote? Yes. Becky? Yes. Ryan? Yes. And I vote yes. That motion passes. Moving into the uh, next section, which is the textbook adoption. Yes, at our last meeting, we talked about the adoption cycle for Japanese, French, and Spanish. Uh, we're in our currently uh, our seventh year of those resources. This adoption will impact both our course offerings at the middle school as well as the high school. We offer first year language at our middle school. There have been no changes since the last meeting. All right. Any questions or comments? Do I have a motion? Move to approve that. Thank you, Ryan. Do I have a second? Thank you, Christy. Christy, how do you vote? Yes. Becky? Yes. Ryan? Yes. And I vote yes. That motion passes. Last one is our VNN Institution Partnership. Mr. Doty. Thank you again. Uh, this was a discussion item at our previous board meeting. And uh, this is just our website, moving to an athletic website as, to ho as hosted by uh, the, this company, VNN. I think there was one small uh, question uh, that Mr. Wirtz ha had uh, with regard to the sponsorship and what the sponsorships looked like on, uh, I think at the time he had his Chromebook up or, or a tablet. I went back, researched that with the, the representative at VNN. They were aware of an issue when you open, at the time you open that up, uh, when, when, if you use a tablet or something like a Chromebook, where the banner looked really, it was it, it was basically overshadowing all other information on the website. They were working on that. They were aware of that. They apologized that <laughs> the you know that view was what was seen at the board meeting, but it has since been fixed. I looked at it on our Chromebook uh, just earlier today, and it, it looked. Uh, normal uh, to me as it does on a, on a, on a desktop. Um, and then obviously on your phone, um, you're, there was never an issue with that because the, it is a, um, it, you know, the, um, the web-based application uh, goes directly, switches over to your mobile device uh, and it's mobile ready. So I think that was really the one, I think, question out there and I hope Hope that I have that answered. I know that was Mr. Wirtz's, and he's, he's not here tonight. But we can. Yep. Any questions for Mr. Right. Doty? Do I have a motion for this action item? I'll move for approval. Thank you, Christy. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ryan. Christy, how do you vote? Yes. Becky? Yes. Ryan? Yes. I vote yes. That motion passes. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Doty. Appreciate it. All right, we'll move to the next uh, section on our agenda. Mr. Lamb, well, so I just wanted to highlight the teacher pre-screen. That should have been up in the consent agenda. For everyone, this is the presentation that Michelle gave uh, last time. We had some questions that Mr. Young needed to address with the company, and after several days, we were able to get an affirmative to our language that he requested. So you have already said yes to this. This is just coming back because Mr. Lamb did sign it. So um, uh, it should have been up in a consent just as a formal process. So that's what we're doing here. So we probably still need to vote on that. Is that correct, Mr. Young? Yes. Yep. So if we could, um, I rec I'm, I'm recommending that we accept uh, Frontline as our pre-screener. Uh, as it meets the language that was described to us by our attorney and they have accepted that. Do I have a motion for that? I'll move for approval. Thank you, Christy. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Becky. Christy, how do you vote? Yes. Becky? Yes. Brian? Yes. And I vote yes. That motion passes. Thank you. And thanks, Thank you. Mr. Young, for the work on that. All right. Now we'll move into the next section, which is the discussion items. And the first item we have is uh, Parent Square. Mrs. Betts. Good evening. So this year um, we have sent out gobs and gobs of communication to our parents, um, even more so than a typical year. 
And as Dr. Clendenning and I have discussed our plan, do, study, adjust process through the year, um, we realized that there were times that our communication could come across as disjointed and unbranded. And so we started to talk a little bit more about that. We knew that there was another mass communication system vendor where a lot of other schools in the community were already customers of theirs. So we reached out to some of our colleagues in these neighboring schools and got rave reviews about Parent Square. So we did set up a call. Um, initially, we s decided on some criteria. In addition to streamlining our process, which we'll talk a little bit more about, and coming up with a branded message to go out to all of our parents and community members, um, we also wanted to make sure that our student data was protected. We wanted to make sure that the phone, email, and text messages were still an option. Um, we wanted to make it accessible to everyone. Um, obviously, we wanted it to be compatible with PowerSchool, so we had an easy flow of information. Um, we wanted to give parents a preference. We want to let them know or choose when, how, and what types of information they receive. And obviously, price is always a determining factor. Mr. Sprout graciously took me through the AHP process, <laughs> which is one of my least favorite processes to do. But it is very helpful when determining those top factors um, that are most important. It allows us to weigh those against the others as we're comparing vendors to make sure that we're making the best possible decision for the district. Um, in this case, security, which was that data protection, customer service, pretty much all things IT came out in the top five, the streamlined approach, email, phone, and texting capabilities, accessibility, and our branded messaging. So our current vendor and ParentSquare both had the opportunity to kind of come to us with their best efforts and what they can provide in a mass communication system. Um, I expected to get pretty much the same product. Um, I was delighted to see that not only did they offer some additional capabilities, they offered some enhanced capabilities on current um, features. So basically when we talk about a streamlined approach, right now um, you can get messages from the district and the building level for Blackboard as well as some transportation groups. But it's not used across the district. You still find those, you know, class dojos, um, class newsletters, school newsletters, um, just lots of different communication tools. And sometimes parents are a little bit overwhelmed with where do I go to get information for my child. And so we really want to take this as an opportunity to educate both parents and our internal, internal stakeholders to show them the best way to communicate so that parents aren't missing out on vital information. Um, one exciting tool that they offer is this classroom communication tool, and it allows teachers to communicate directly with parents as a whole classroom or one-on-one. -on -one. Um, another feature about this that our current vendor did not offer is that the, we, Parent Square will allow us to have two-way communication. Oftentimes, we're just sending out, sending out, sending out. Well, this allows us to collect that feedback and have an ongoing conversation with our stakeholders. Um, social and web share, that doesn't go away. We'll still have the opportunity in a little more streamlined approach to be able to share our messages that we're sharing in a mass notification way, also to our social sites and websites. Um, they create and allow us to create newsletter templates. So all of our information will be going out in a branded format with logos, color schemes, everything that screams Franklin. Um, they have an enhanced oversight and reporting. Um, I'm really excited about this. Blackboard has this. Um, Parent Square makes it easy. So now we'll be able to kind of track the success of our messages, how many are being opened, thrown away, who do we need to update an email account for? So all of that comes. Um, on the teacher side of life, it also allows you to set up form libraries where you can just send out permission slips, parent-teacher conference sign-ups, um, volunteer sign-ups. Um, sometimes on social media, you'll see, we're having a party and I need five of this, six of this, seven of this. This will do that and generate that for you so that teachers can just send it out 
from a template and forget it and the items will show up in the classroom. Um, one of my favorite capabilities of the Parent Square option is it, there is an immediate translation for the preferred language of the end user. So when I mentioned we could have that two-way communication even in a private or a private message chat, if my preferred language is English but I'm communicating with someone whose preferred language is Spanish, it is automatically translated to and from as the message is being sent. Right now I do feel that there's a lapse in my communication with those parents who may not have a preference of English and this is going to allow us to reach those parents on a timely basis and hopefully we'll see more engagement, um, more feedback, just exciting stuff. Along with the other capabilities that we always have, mass communications and automatic notifications. Um, ParentScore does offer a mobile app. You don't have to download it for this to be a successful tool, but it is really nice to have everything in the palm of your hand. You can set it up for um, push notifications. So you're still gonna get your mass communication, especially in an emergency, but you can put that option on there to get additional information um, a little bit more timely if you'd like it that way. Um, it's also more of a one-stop shop, so we can choose to push attendance, lunch balance, a lot of those things that come out in different methods right now, we can also push that information through Parent Square. We're looking at, um, right now it's a $4 per student, and for this initial um, year we are using CARES Act dollars to fund this, and after year one we'll go back and kind of reevaluate how the process worked, um, if it's a good fit for us, and make another determination. Roger, I just got the terms of agreement, so I have not had a chance to send those to you, but we will do so before next month, and I'm happy to answer any other questions you might have. Is there a limit on how many people you can send out? I mean, if it's four bucks per kid, but they have mom and dad and stepmom and dad and grandma wants to be on the list, is that all? Does that work or is there a max? Yes, they can have more than one demographic or parent guardian who they want to send information to, yes. And it's really parent-led, so they can choose if they want just email on just Northwood and maybe some athletics. So the parent really has a lot of say in what kind of information they're receiving, but no, there's not a limit per se on who can receive it. Cool. So Robin, a couple years ago, we had the audit of the current provider and we were ding for accessibility and I believe inclusion and we struggled to get some support. Is this new product going to be easier on that support? So the initial complaint from the Office of Civil Rights was on our website. Um, since then, we've been able to get some support there. Um, we talked to Parent Square about this and that's that accessibility piece, not only the language, but the ADA compliance. And yes, we are further down the line now that this is something that more and more vendors are coming to the table with because we, they know that we have to have it. So I feel confident in that. They've talked a lot about things that I'm seeing every day on the website as far as accessibility goes, so yes. Good, thank you. And so, <clears throat> excuse me, if a classroom teacher wanted to send home um, a newsletter, then they would still be able to, but they would now use this as opposed to what they're doing now or? or yes, that's our to? hope. Um, I talked to a few different districts to just talk about how they got everyone on board with this. And there's been a lot of different approaches. Some just have a hard stop date and say, you know, beginning with this next school at implementation, this is the tool that they'll use. Um, others have had a softer approach where they will migrate out the old vendors and tools and input the parent square in its place. What, what's your recommendation for us? Do you want that hard stop or do you want to migrate it? I haven't given a lot of thought because of COVID. It hasn't been a typical year and I don't think it's going to be a typical summer. Um, and in other summers we might have more um, availability for training. Whereas this summer I know 
we need to give them rest. And we've also got the Jumpstart program coming. So I'm not necessarily married to one idea or another, but. Do, do we know the migration of data? So if you have a parent's information that's in our current system, will it migrate over to the new system? Or is that going to be another manual process? So it, it'll come from Power School. I apologize. The data in Power School will come over, but the information on Blackboard will be distinct and it will not migrate over. Okay. Which Power School is what we're using now yep. to get our data to Blackboard? Yep. I would think if this gets approved, I think we would look at a soft rollout first semester, and then when we get in January, tell everybody this is what we need to go to for that branding. But as far as training and everything, we want to make sure people are comfortable with this resource. Um, so I, I do think we will have a hard stop date sometime in 21, 22. Well, I, I guess my question is, yep. when is the contract up for the yep. existing system, right? Oh. To make sure we don't renew the contract for the existing yeah. Right. So for me, that's the hard stuff. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay. okay. Right? Yep. So I, I think our understanding was we would try to have implementation complete by that August right. start date. Yep. Um, I mean, unless you guys come in and say that the contract's up in July yep. and, and we just need to, you know, to get into the year, but, but let's yep. think about the timing yep. to, to make sure that if we do a transition, that's great, but let's not, go into another year with the current with, provider with if we don't have to. Yeah. Matt, are you familiar? When is the termination uh, date? Okay. Yeah. And we, we get that back to you, okay. but I, I, that's a good point. I know that the, the two of them have talked about, then Robin and I have had a conversation about that very, you know, termination of Blackboard's portion as well as that. Yep. Yep. And my plan was to put together um, both some in-person and then video trainings this summer and maybe see if I could find a core group of teachers that would be willing to pilot it that first semester um, just to kind of work out any problems they may have, um, change up the training to make sure we're all speaking the same language and that they're understanding and that I'm understanding their needs. And then semester was kind of what I thought as yeah. well, but. Mm -hmm. Robin, is this more user friendly than, than Blackboard, do you think, for the teachers? I mean, is it gonna be are you going to get a pushback and go, oh, no, we don't want to do this. It's a little harder or? I think any new software, you, you run the risk of a little bit of pushback. Um, personally, when I looked at Parent Square, at Parent Square um, I felt pretty comfortable with it. I've, I've used Blackboard for quite a while, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty comfortable with that as sure. well. Um, I think in mass communication itself, the ease is pretty comparable. I think what pushes Parent Square ahead is all the additional features right. that it can provide. Okay, thank you. I do think there's one resource that teachers are using now that they really like, and that's Class Dojo. If you're using that, a lot of teachers uh, find it very simple and easy to communicate with moms and dads. So that that will be one that we'll have to show them that there is the same ease of use to communicate. But Class Dojo uh, is one that teachers really like especially at the elementary level it's a way to communicate in an age appropriate fashion okay. thanks mr lamb is june 30th is our extending contract for blackboard okay thank you and if i can add to what robin said we could make that migration because uh parent square does an excellent job of the current feature set it would be training the principals on how to use the new system what robin's done an excellent job of is that next step in parent communication from the teachers that isn't that's something new that we can do at a later point okay so if there was a desire to do it right away we could do that and just migrate the principles over thank you all right thank you thank if you, you think Thanks. of anything else send me an email and i'll have an answer ready for you all right thanks robin All right, the next item is our book rental and fees. This is Dr. Warren. Yes, very good. There are a couple of documents that are linked to this area of the agenda. The first lists uh, six additional consumable novels under consideration from our English department and U.S. history is in there as well. A change at the eighth grade level and at the English 10 workshop level. The remaining four, uh, three of them are in uh, alignment with our AP curriculum, 
And the final one is a, a novel required by Indiana University for us to teach that course, uh, that ACP U.S. History course. So I'm happy to entertain any questions if there are questions. I do want to thank the teachers. Every year, I, especially with the English department, we did an adoption last year. And there were a number of uh, parents who helped us with that adoption. And one of the things we heard from parents, both on the committee and off the committee, was we really want our kids to have a book. We want them to take the book home, to write in the book, to uh, draw in the book, highlight in the book, and keep the book. Uh, or not, right? Uh, so we are working toward that model, and so you're seeing some of that movement. We actually adopted with that format in mind, and so uh, we were very cognizant of that as we were walked through our plan, do, study, do, just process last year. So just wanted to thank our teachers and the crew that's been working on this. On the rentals and fees document, there are a number of items. Uh, that we include in this aspect. As you know, our Chromebooks are considered part of our uh, rental and consumable items. Uh, kindergarten and first grade are listed there. Uh, thank you, Matt, for your partnership on this component as well. Uh, kindergarten will be a five-year uh, cost divided over a five-year, and then as per tradition, first grade, you will see fifth grade and ninth grade costs are included. That's our normal pattern there. Uh, Five, six, same th thing, it's a Chromebook um, scenario. Seven, eight, uh, we already approved the rental adoption for French, Spanish, and Japanese. You will see those listed there for both middle school and high school. I also wanted to note on the eighth grade side, we did have a price drop of around $5 due to changes in consumable novels, so I wanted to list that one. Under the high school, again, under the new adoption, you will see the rentals and consumable charges for the English novels. Some of those have already been approved. Those that haven't were on that prior list. Again, I'm happy to entertain any questions there. The new course we have that we're bringing online, uh, our final of our four-year sequence in Project Lead the Way, Biomedical Innovation. It is actually uh, an internship type model course. That course is new, the final in that process. We will be training the faculty this summer. They're pretty excited. You will see that course listed with its lab fee. That's a pretty standard lab fee for Project Lead the Way courses. There's a significant lab component. You will see on the updated course fees, the final section, all of those courses are a lot of our hands-on. Our lab courses at the high school level, the first three are facts. Now, I will tell you in some cases, you'll, you'll see the, um, the rationale, a brief rationale for many of those classes, if not all. We had parents come forward and say, you know what, you're asking me to purchase my own sewing kit, you're asking kids to bring in fabric, it's just easier for us if you charge us the fee and you take care of it. It was less stressful. Teachers know what type of sewing kits they want, they know what type of fabric they want, parents just felt like it would be easier for us to wrap that in. So that explains some of those increase in costs there. You'll see the Project Lead the Way cost, all of those supplies are, um, expense to us from Project Lead the Way. Many of those supplies, we, we can sometimes, if we can find an equivalent at an Amazon or a Walmart, or we will try to find a cheaper option, some of those supplies we cannot. So we are at the, the mercy of Project Lead the Way in those cases. You'll see art there as well. We've added a ceramics component to those courses, so that increased those fees, which is, I'm excited about that opportunity for our students to have that additional, um, art course, uh, English, and then finally, our ag courses, again, uh, materials and supplies. So please let me know if you have any questions. Can you remind me, if, if you want to be in a class but mom can't afford the fee, what's the process? Some of it depends, Ryan, on your status, so how the state sees you and how you're billed according to whether you're free and reduced lunch or paid lunch. Then in other cases, you can call. There's a great team at the high school. Sam is there. Laura Maddox is there as well to talk through payment plans if that's the case. So again, there, there is a, a conversation about where, where you fall. Great question. Thank you. 
Well, and also to that point, Ryan, some of these classes, many of these classes are classes you choose. And so sometimes there is a difference in looking at what I've chosen or what I'm required to take mm -hmm. and what are those expenses that are connected with those classes. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Next item is our <laughs> Bowen Center MOU. Is Mrs. Sperling on the line? She's, She's right here in person. Here in person. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't see you. <laughs> She's hanging out with the puppy dog back there. Uh -huh. um, good evening, school, school board members and friends. Um, I'm here tonight to ask the school board to accept and approve the MOU agreement between Franklin Community Schools and the Bowen Center. The Bowen Center is a community-based mental health center located up, around, up north around Goshen, Indiana, and they are now starting to provide mental health services in Johnson County. Although it's limited, they are still starting to, um, to provide services in Johnson County, and I'm excited to be partnering with them. This new partnership will help to bridge the gap in mental health services our students are currently experiencing and will also add an additional layer of mental health support for our district. Um, the Bowen Center will teach skills-based interventions and strategies to our students and help them focus and be more successful in the classroom as well as at home. Um, what's awesome about this opportunity is it will allow for um, students to receive these services in school or at home um, because the Bowen Center likes to bring in and wrap around services with the family and incorporate them in with the mental health journey. I don't know how much additional information that you would like, so I'm happy to entertain any questions. Mrs. Sperling, you unfortunately have the pleasure to bring it in. This it happens at least once a year. Um, if you would go to the signature page and please have them <laughs> change the spelling of my last name. Oh, absolutely. I will do that, sir, right away. I'm so sorry about that. No, no, that's okay. It happens. It usually happens once a year. So I just... I'm sorry that I'm that one time of year. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't sound like there's any questions. So thank you so much for your time this evening. And uh, next month, uh, Mrs. Sperling will be back with us. If you recall, in January, um, she had an outstanding presentation. Oh, yeah. And it was interrupted yeah. by technology and COVID and everything else. So we said after uh, we get back in person, we would ever come back in and kind of give us a, a mini version of that. And with this as a topic, we'll have her come back in May to kind of recapture the highlights of where we are in mental health for this school year. I'm excited. Yep. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, and the last item under the discussions is our TransFinder bus routing. Good evening, everyone. Um, the past several months, uh, I've been looking at our transportation software, what we use for um, routing our students. Um, we have a map style now that is very outdated. Um, it's a 2004 model. Um, while I can go in there and I can add um, roads and, and new additions and stuff, our map style now does not use lat long coordinates on it. So it makes it impossible to migrate into any of the, the parent apps and such that you've seen come out over the past six or seven years. Um, Without the map upgrade, it's, it's impossible to go to any of those. Um, the upgrade is costly enough to where we decided it was probably time to see what other types of software was out on the market, um, if what we were using is what we want to stay with. Um, so, you can forward, Natalie. Um, so, what we've done is uh, we, we, what we're looking to do is to 
get a map that is that will automatically put in the the new housing developments and such um, improve customer service to families and try to reduce some of the calls into the transportation center um, as well as increase efficiency um, with a, with a different software uh, the things that we were looking for whenever we were looking at, at the various softwares that were out there, one was ease of use. Um, we didn't want to get anything that, that seemed daunting um, or, or difficult to learn so that at least um, myself and the two ladies I have in the office could use and learn easily and, and so that we all can kind of tag team those kind of things. Um, also, uh, this year with COVID and as many changes that we had to make on the fly, I did get a lot of, a lot of calls from parents asking, well, why don't you have the Where's the Bus app? Um, and, you know, so that, that came up this year more often than, than it has in the past. You know, I've got a half a dozen calls or so in the past about it, but, but you know, as we move through COVID, that, that and we had to make changes on the fly that came up more and more often. Um, also, uh, communication delays. The, these apps that they have out now, we can send uh, push notifications on those, um, which I'll get into a little bit more here, here in a few minutes, um, as well as the registration process. It's difficult to find out from parents who's actually going to ride the bus. Um, sometimes we never Find, we never get an answer and so generally that happens at the high school level you know we, we don't get the feedback and so we we have to route for a bus worst case scenario and then after the first you know few weeks of school then we kind of start paring down and figuring out okay who's who's really going to ride and who's not um, again the, the map update process um, we know our current vendor that the cost was was high enough to where you know it, it uh, made it worthwhile for us to, to look around and see what else was out there. Routing flexibility, uh, some of the new softwares that are out there is a whole lot easier to, to change routes around. Um, and I'll get, get to that a little bit more here in a minute. Um, compatibility with our existing GPS equipment. Right now we use Synovia, um, so we know where all of our buses are at at any time. We know when, when the door opens, we know when um, the battery's dead, we know when um, the stop arm's deployed, when the stop arm goes in, student door opens, so we know a whole lot of things. And those we already have on our buses, so integration to that um, is something that we looked at. Um, customer, customer support timelines. Um, right now with our current vendor, it's not unheard of to place a call to them in <coughs> late July whenever, we're, whenever I'm needing to make changes to place a call for their help and they then don't get me called back for another day or two. Um, so we wanted to look at that, what type of customer support these companies had um, and then Data security, which Matt Sprout was involved with, with meeting these companies to see what they used on their end because most of these nowadays are web-based, um, where our current software is housed on our servers here. Um, so Matt was involved with that. Um, and then the track record of the, the companies that we looked at. We, we wanted to see you know, what, what they've done, how many school corporations they had under their belt um, and their longevity. Um, we looked at um, three different software providers. One is Traversa, and Traversa is made by the uh, current software provider that we have right now. Um, it's, it's a web-based version of, of what we have. Um, the next one was TransFinder. And the next one was Edulog. And each of those was, was evaluated against the requirements that we were looking for. And we felt that TransFinder fit the 
to build the, the best out of everything that we were looking for. Um, you can scroll down, Natalie. Uh, TransFinder uh, has given us several different things as far as, you know, how many schools they're in. I know they're in 60 schools here in Indiana. Um, and then here over the past several years, more than 300 school districts switched to TransFinder and 20% of the students in the USA are routed with their software. Um, TransFinder, the way that, that it works at a very high level is PowerSchool, which is our student information system, feeds to RouteFinder, which is their bus routing software, then to ViewFinder, which is a high level view that a secretary or principal can use at the school, um, to Stop Finder, which that's the parent app for, for basically where is the bus, and then Wayfinder, which is a, um, an app that they have where we can put a, uh, a tablet on the bus to help substitute drivers know the route. So the difficulty in getting school bus drivers, if we can try to take some of that anxiety um, off of their shoulders, then, uh, then it would help out a lot. So um, this next slide, I was telling you about uh, that our current software does not use lat long coordinates. What that means in a nutshell is that if you have the 1,000 block to 2,000 block of, of, say, a country road and the address is 1,500, it puts it in the middle. It, it has no idea where that's at. It just it picks the middle because it's 1,500. There could be a cornfield for three-fourths of that road but it doesn't know any better. This system here actually, since it used lat long, it actually picks the house up. So those, time, those times are more accurate and you know, as it, this translates more into the parent app, then you get a lot more specific time on when, when your student's gonna be home or the bus gets there to pick them up. Um, the next, next item is safe stop boundaries. Um, our current software, what it has is that on wherever we place a bus stop at, then a certain radius around that, it, they basically the system sets up the closest bus stop for that student. Unless we put in there that there's a road that a student can't cross, the system doesn't know any better such as on this example here, say if that stop 14 right there, say that that's a, 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 a highway right there. If we, we can draw in TransFinder the exact student that we want to go to that bus stop, we don't have to worry about going in and putting uh, information on a road that delineates that road that a student can't cross. This here, we can go in and we can directly say, these are the students that we want going here. Um, and, so, and so we can set that up with, with all the stops. Uh, and right now, in our software that we have now, we have um, where you have, you know, the uh, child, uh, perpetrators that we can we can list on our software we can just upload that and then we can put a boundary around that and it will keep those students from walking into that boundary hmm. so this we can do the same thing with as well as you know upload those those addresses so um, viewfinder again that is a the system that transfinder has where this is where it helps us out in the office a lot in that all the secretaries, um, all the principals, anyone that we give access to, and you can switch the page there now, anyone we can get, give access to can go ahead and pull up that information. So if a parent calls in to the school um, asking a secretary, okay, I, I, I don't know when my students get picked up or where the bus stop's at, that's what they can pull up on their own. Um, they can pull this up. They don't have the rights to go in and change anything, 
but they can pull that up and we can we can do that since it's web based we can do that at all the buildings and and um, anyone can pull that information up as well as you switch to the next next slide um, as well as the uh, uh, tablet and and your phone so at the um, uh, first day of school, whenever we're out on those sidewalks trying to get the students to the right bus, anybody can pull this up on their smartphone that has access to it. Um, you know, I know Dr. Dr. C has been out there with us, Mr. Sewell, and, and there's a number of teachers are out on the sidewalk trying trying to get the kids to the, to the right bus. So, so this provides that, um, and that's a viewfinder. Um, the next thing is the parent app, um, Stop Finder. Um, this is what their app looks like. It's a, a pretty simple process in that we send the parent an invite uh, via, an e via email. Um, the, the parent then uh, activates their account and then the third screen there is, is what the parent can see um, as far as, you know, where the bus stops at, the time, um, bus number, and so on. Um, the next uh, next screen here is, is a few screens of what the parent would see on there. Um, we can send out push notifications. Go ahead to the next one if you would, Natalie. We can send out push notifications, and this is what the, the parent would see on their screen. You know, if we if we had a bus that had a had a breakdown or just late getting off the lot, we can send out a push notification. Um, if there's an accident along the way and, and a bus has to reroute, we can send that out immediately to, to those students that are, that are left on that route. The, the parent, whenever they get this app, they're able to set up um, multiple uh, geofences of when they want notifications. Um, they can set it up, say, when, when the uh, bus enters their subdivision, they can set that up so they can get a notification, hey, my, the bus is going to be there, I need to be at the bus stop to get my student here in five minutes or what have you. Um, and, and the same way of a morning, you know, the bu bus is on their way, kind of eliminates some time that, that's spent out on cold mornings. Um, so, again, the parent can set up multiple alerts. Um, so that would be that would be a huge benefit, something that, especially this past year, that the um, parents were asking for. The next item on this is Wayfinder. Uh, this is the app for the uh, substitute drivers. Um, basically, what we would do is get, I, I think it was five. We, we can put them on all buses, but there's really not a need to. What we do is get like five tablets and you download the route onto the tablet of a morning. Pretty quick process. Then it Velcros to the dash of the bus um, and it will give turn by turn directions for the driver and where that bus stop is at. Um, Indiana has, has a law to where a driver of a school bus can't drive with the screen of this on. So the, the software is set up that the screen goes dark whenever the bus goes into motion. So, and then it'll come back on. And then th those are the, the, uh, the, the different things that we looked at here. Some other items that, that can be added down the road are, you know, they, they've got software out now um, that will work with this, is where a student can badge on and badge off the bus. Um, so that we know at all times when mm -hmm. a student got on and whenever they got off the bus, as well as there's a couple others out now. It, it's one of those technologies that's advancing a lot. Um, what we'd like to do on implementation of this, if, if it's accepted, is that um, the parent app, we especially want to roll it out um, with a lot of, um, information ahead of time because it's one of those things if they go in and they set up their geofence wrong and, and things such as that then we don't want to get upset well that thing doesn't work mm -hmm. anyway and then not use it so we want we want to be able to roll that out the best possible way we could so 
we are thinking to roll that out at the beginning of the 21-22 school year for the parent app. But then um, prior to that, um, TransFinder would um, create our new map, import our student data that we have now, duplicate, duplicate our existing routes, and provide training to us over the summer. We would start up this coming school year with our current software that we're using and then start migrating in the office over to TransFinder so that we're getting well versed on it so that um, at the beginning of the second semester we can roll out, go ahead and roll out the using this software, um, the TransFinder. So basically get, get some time under our belt knowing how to answer questions and stuff when our parents call in and, and how, to, how to use it real well. Um, so, any, any questions? And I went through that plan <clears throat> fast. So, I have a question. Okay. Um, so, let's say that um, you ha you're a parent and you have this, the app, um, and your child's school bus gets stopped by the train. Who's, who's putting that information in there? Our, our buses got stopped at the train. Are, is, the, is the driver like radioing that in and somebody in your office puts that in so yeah, then the if, parents would Yeah, that? Typ typically, and over the past couple of years, we've had exactly that same thing with, with a lot of works on the tracks and stuff. But what they would do, the driver would call in to our office and then one of the secretaries would put that in there. Um, so, and they're, they're able to know, in the software, they're able to know basically who's left on the bus. So, it, so if that driver has ran half their route and now we're stuck at a train track, um, which, it, which doesn't happen as much now as what it used to, but whenever they were working on tracks, it, it seemed like it was every day that buses could run 15 to 20 minutes behind. Driver would radio in, I'm at, I'm at a, a railroad track, I don't see anyone around, the train has stopped, we can send that out, that push notification out right away. And then my other question is, um, I know daily you're having to change, like this bus is now, we're not running that bus today, it's now this bus. Um, is that something also that you can alert parents yes. to? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's something that we can send out. You know, even if, it, if it's something just as simple as that the bus is gonna be running on time, but it's a different bus, mm -hmm. then we can send that out. You know, bus 150 is 163 today. Or it can be, you know, what, what we ended up a lot with this past this past year, with COVID and and several drivers out of close contacts and stuff. We can say, okay, bus 150 and 163 are doubled up today. You know, if your student rides 163, you can expect you know your student to be, you know, 15 or 20 minutes late. Uh, so those those are things that we can easily send out a lot quicker. Right now, we send those messages out as many of them as we can via Blackboard Connect, but it's not, it's not an easy system as far as, I mean, it, it's easy to send those out, but when we send them out, we don't know in there who's still on the bus or anything. So, mm -hmm. so the message just gets sent out, and, and to be frank with you, it, it really ends up with more calls coming into the office than not because people call in, hey, did you just call me? And so, so now all of a sudden we're tied up answering these calls of people wondering why we called. And it just, it's kind of a vicious circle. So, so I'm, I'm hoping that this will uh, leave a lot, a lot of that um, where, you know, we, we have secretaries that can answer the, phone, answer the phone as far as giving Bus information, which again is another thing that, that the girls in the office are answering a lot of whenever routing is going on because that's when parents call, hey, my student needs to ride home this afternoon. Can you tell me what bus I need to get on? Well, this is during routing time in the morning. You know, They don't know, but it's on their mind at the time, and so they're calling in, and so it just, it just gets real hectic in there in the morning. So. Thank you. Yes. Um, right now, we, uh, Mr. Young and the uh, and TransFinder is, is working through some verbiage um, issues 
with the contract, so we're hoping to get those items solved soon and, and get that, that contract in front of you. projects we would do with CARES Act funding. Uh, so we do have preliminary cost estimates on that. We'll have uh, this on your next board agenda, but the implementation quote was 48,000 and some and some change. I don't remember the exact number off the top of my head. Um, but I think, uh, again, as we, as we look at the cost of updating our mapping, as, as Mr. Dickinson expressed, we were at a decision point on what's the best <coughs> path forward for us. Um, I see uh, this man do miracles about every day mm -hmm. with um, making adjustments to um, our, our bus routes to, to get students to school safely. And I really feel like uh, this software and making this move right now is a way to, to, to help them get that job done a little bit easier and also be more um, responsive and provide uh, even better communication uh, to our, our families. So, uh, appreciate your consideration for that, and we'd be glad to take any questions you have about it. One of the, one of the things that the gentleman that was uh, showing us how Transfinder work, um, especially with with the issues we had this past year with COVID, is that he was able to pull up two bus routes, and, and it was as simple as this: he pulled up two bus routes, and he was able to, you know, let's say both bus routes have 15 stops on them. He was able to, say, if we wanted to split one of those routes, he was able to take, say, the last seven stops off of one route and just move them as a group to the other route. And as soon as he'd done that, it updated the times and everything. So hmm. if you had the app, the, the Stop Finder app, then that information is automatically updated. So if you was expecting when your child got home, all of a sudden now that information is updated on your app. So you know, as simple as that. If, again, on a typical year, we don't have to make those drastic changes, but this past year we did, and so it really showed the, the shortcomings that we that we had with, with what we're using now, so. I'd also like to clarify that the initial cost includes the implementation, design, and training. So the annual cost, I don't remember what it was, but it's about half of that, 22,000 maybe? Yeah, yeah, I think the, uh, the, the first work year was a little bit more, but I think it was 22 to 25, and then I think the second year was 15. So, 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 yeah, so how, how does that compare to what we're paying today? For the, right, for right now, I think we're paying our, our current uh, vendor, I believe it's 10000 a year for what we have now, and the, um, the map upgrade, to, to get us to where we're using a, a, a current map is six to 8,000 and more on the high side of that. So, that so they, we're, we're pretty close to a break even, but we're, yeah. but we're delivering more capability, yeah. more technology to, to better support the families and the students. Correct. More safety. Yeah. And, more, sa and more safety, yeah. Again, you described very well the phones blow up anytime exactly. something does go to plan. If we can have a system that automatically updates and pushes that information out, their, their lives are going to be a lot easier and, and there's going to be less frustration on the part of our families, too. Yep. Nice work on finding Yeah, this. very good. Yep. Thank you. All right, we'll move to the next section of the agenda, which is our board administrative comments. I'll open it up for the board if there's any comments this evening. Seeing none, Dr. Cohen-Denning, administrative comments? Yes, I'm going to first ask uh, Dr. Worland and Ms. Gross to jump in on this one. Yes, I'd like to provide the board with an update on our CARES II application. Um, that application did go live um, during spring break. Mm -hmm. So um, Dr. Worland and I had a chance over spring break to sit down and kind of talk about what we wanted to um, request 
in that application and also knowing that with CARES 2, we can go backwards so we can recover some of those um, COVID costs that we had all the way back to March of 2020. With CARES Act 3, it's only going forwards um, and it's over the next two school years, so it's a long time. Um, but in CARES 2, we're kind of uh, focused on recovering some of those costs. So we, um, you heard about Parent Square. That's, that'll be a request in CARES 2. Um, HVAC at Webb for about $800,000. And this is um, an allowable category of improving, improving air quality. So um, Mr. Sewell is working on engaging um, an architect um, or specialist to give us better estimates on that. We are also, um, I, I received some advice from our representative at um, the Indiana Office of Homeland Security. She seems to think that FEMA will decline um, the technology expenses that we submitted and some of the operating expenses. So we're going to go ahead and include some of those in our CARES 2. And then if FEMA gets approved, then we can always go back and amend. Um, but we thought it would be safe to go ahead and ask for some of those items. Um, some of those items include the hotspots, um, our upgrades to high-speed internet, video conferencing kits, um, all of those things that all those technology costs that we incurred during that um, time of virtual learning and virtual meetings. Um, Google Meet licenses, um, we converted a lot of our paper forms to online forms. Um, we ended up having to buy Chromebooks for our developmental pre-K students. Um, our online curriculum for <laughs> secondary um, through Apex Learning. Our tents that we've set up um, at each of the buildings, we're gonna go ahead and request uh, reimbursement for those. Two-way radios um, for car rider lines and directing traffic. Um, you heard about the bus routing software. We're also requesting um, reimbursement for the emergency FMLA costs that we incurred. So far, we're up to about 140,000, so we'll be able to re recover some of that in our budget. And then another big ticket item um, is we're proposing to issue 2% um, stipends to all certified and classified staff, hopefully in June, um, prior to the end of our current bargaining agreement. Um, but just, you know, another thank you for a very challenging school year and all the hard work that everybody's put into that, so. And that would be everybody? That would be everyone, including substitute teachers. We included them this time. Oh, that's cool. Um, as long as they taught between 19 and 20 days. And they have to be a current employee. Um, so, but that that cost is estimated to be 555000 So that's a pretty big ticket item. But um, a lot of the schools are doing this. They're doing it in a stipend form. That way um, it's a one-time cost and um, that's what this funding is meant to be. So, and Brooke and I have, have talked to, um, we've sat in on a couple webinars, gotten a better idea of what's gonna get, a, get approved and what's not gonna get mm -hmm. approved. And this is something that, um, that they have kind of put their verbal blessing on, so. So the, with the CARES Act, is it, it's a bucket of money that schools can apply for or we get cash, we know what's coming towards us? I'm sorry, I should have said that. We, we know we're getting um, 2.1 million in CARES 2. And all those things you listed are what you're proposing we spend it on? Yes. And the government says yes, you can spend it on that? Yes. And if they say no, <clears throat> can you find something else to fill the gap in? Yes. yes. So we got 2.1 $2. million. For the second CARES Act? Yes. And the 1.9 trillion that just passed, we don't know how much we're going to get for that one yet. But it'll probably be more than the 2.1? It will. Correct. I love it. I love it. And it's the same rules, you, you tell them what you want to spend it on and they say? Yes. For the most part, in, in CARES 3, 20% of that, those dollars, they're telling us already must be sent on what they're calling advanced learning, 
Now that those are things like SEL, uh, summer jumpstart programming, uh, special ed positions, um, those sorts of things. Um, and it has to actually include special ed and English learners. Those are required are components. Are there things that we can do to impact how much we get, or is it based on like the size of our school and some other There's a formula to it. It's actually the Title I formula. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Cool. Good job. Very good. We have a few more things. Yeah. We haven't spent all that money yet, Ryan. I know. I'm just, I'm sitting down. I'm still here. Yeah. Wait till I get to item two on, on this next short list. Um, for the accelerated learning components, and as we think about sustained innovation, two forward thinking things. Uh, one, uh, IRE 3 deep dive. We have a number of teachers in all of our elementaries across the district being led by Natalie Black. We're providing transportation to, to students to stay Tuesday and Thursday after school for about an hour and a half to work on really diving into that literacy before we retest in May, May 25th. So we're providing snacks again and transportation. So I'm really excited to see this is a new format for us. Uh, it's a different way of looking at this type of support for students. So I'm excited to see how that goes. We also have in here, Ryan, more therapy dogs. Good. So <laughs> we, uh, as you've already noted, it is an area of success for us. Yes. It's the data shows that, the, not just the anecdotal data, but the, the quantitative data shows that. So we do have that component worked in. Again, SEL is something they want to see because we know mental health has suffered quite significantly looking across the state at the data uh, in adults and students during COVID. So we have that in there. Uh, we also have now stepping back, so we're going backwards again. We worked in the high school teacher that we hired to help administer APEX. So that we're trying to reimburse that component from the COVID expense list that we had. Now looking forward, uh, we've added in a developmental preschool teacher because our numbers are growing. Yes, they're, they're accelerating in that area and we need that support. Mm. So we've added that position in as well. I will note, although we have spent a lot of time in webinars with the state and frankly on the phone with the state and email with the state, uh, we don't yet have the final details about SR3, but we have tried to develop SR2 in conjunction with SR3. I'm sorry, CARES, CARES2, CARES3. When I say SR, it's the same thing. Because we're trying to really be smart about how we spend the money, we're mindful that you can look backwards with, with the second round of funding, but you can't with the third. So we're trying to make sure we've got the right stuff in the right bucket of money. So we have a pretty lengthy list, I think yeah. already, mm -hmm. from a number of our stakeholders, from special ed to FCTA, to our leadership team of things that we know that, that we're, we need, that we're looking at. So you'll be hearing more and more about those dollars. We'll submit these probably in the next week and a half. They're due about mid-May, May we think. Yeah, May 15th. We'll submit them fairly quickly, hoping that the state will respond so that we can get the dollars and start moving forward. The state has hired additional staff to help because of the increase in this round of funding, CARES 1, then we had CARES 2, and we're gonna have CARES 3. And so I think they're trying to work more efficiently. If something's not approved, they'll send it back and say, okay, tweak this or do this. And it's the state level that does all this as a yes or no? Correct. The money's coming from the federal government, but it's all ran through the state and the state has to manage it. They have done a remarkable job getting us here to this point. And uh, CARES 3 will be probably double. So you're mm -hmm. seeing the additional work that they're gonna have. And they've done a, a nice job of making a seamless CARES 2, 3. And ultimately, the kids are going to benefit. Mm -hmm. um, one thing I would like to highlight, I talked to Brooke today about this, and this is coming actually from uh, Laura Alexander mm -hmm. and Jen Scott have been working on a plan for special education, and we're looking at providing some type of summer camp experience for essential skills students and other students with special needs during this summer block. Uh, for accelerated learning. So that's going to be an exciting thing I think we're going to be able to provide to kind of springboard that as we move into the next school year for adaptive PE and different things along those ways. So we're, we're going to have something for everybody. Cool. So. 
We should note too, the timeline for these, these two grants, these upcoming grants, they start when we receive the dollars and they will end September of 2023. So it's a, it's a two year, pretty quick timeline for what will be millions of Just, dollars. It has to be spent out. It has yeah. to be spent and it's a one-time thing. It's not a, yeah. you know, a revolving thing, so. Mr. Lamb, I have several other things of note to comment as well. Yeah, you're fine. Uh, first up, uh, the prom is the 26th. We are doing a prom. We're excited about that, Mr. Rayhouse. 23rd. Huh? 23rd. 23rd, okay. <laughs> it's the 26th, too. No, it's 23rd. It's Friday. Sorry. Sorry. I'm so excited. It's the 23rd. Um, uh, so the prom is here. It is going to be with just our students. We're not allowing anybody... Um, from outside, if a kid's dating somebody else, they don't get to come. It really is focused on the seniors and Mr. House and, and the, the team. I think it's uh, Mrs. Hash and a couple other teachers uh, that have worked hard to put this together. It's going to be on our campus. Um, they'll be at different venues throughout the campus doing different activities, but we are having a prom. The kids will dress up, and it's going to be a nice event. Um, also on that... Um, Coming up, graduation is the 29th, a Saturday. It's at 10 o'clock. Um, we are going to be outside. Right now, if, ever, if it were happening tomorrow, we could only have half capacity at the stadium. Mm -hmm. So talking to Mr. A. House, looking at half capacity, that would give parents probably four tickets per student. Um, and then additionally, we would have the students sit uh, on the football field again. And then this year, one change you would like to see is if, if faculty and staff would like to come back, they would also be on the football field. Now, board, I know in the, in the every year except COVID year, we all got to be on stage. We are not going to be able to be on stage again. Um, it'll only be uh, Mr. House, and then actually Dr. Warland is, is sitting in because my son's graduating the Air Force Academy uh, that same week, and so uh, I will be away, unfortunately, for our graduation this year, and the only time that that's happened. So, so if I could on that, Dr. Yep. Funding, for, for the board, my recommendation was that we step away again this year to make sure the parents have the tickets sure. and attendance. Sure. If you guys disagree with that or would like to participate, let Dr. Coinding know. Yep. But I think, again, because we're going to be limited on seating, we take away a seat from a parent if yeah. we show up. We're not going to do anything. We're not we like would not sit on the right? field with the, with the staff. You could if you would like to. Yeah. But yep. then I don't, yeah. That's why I was saying we wouldn't be right. in the bleachers yep. and taking seats from the It's still half capacity. We'll have to guesstimate right. how many yeah, people are going to but, but you're definitely welcome. But I, I, Mr. Lamb and I did talk about that, and I think this will be the last year of COVID. Let's knock on wood that we'll be able to do that. But um, okay. we do believe four tickets, and then if, it, if COVID would go away and we could get more tickets for full capacity, then he would do that. But right now, sure. in conversation with Mr. Hales, we're anticipating four tickets um, for that. The diplomas are in. I believe somebody has them right now. And so if, if you can just note that, and Natalie will help us be the courier to and from everyone uh, to get those to Mr. Ahouse. I, I think similarly to the past years, the students will not be given their diplomas like we have in the past with uh, Dr. Warland or Mr. Ahouse. They will have them. They'll come up. They'll take a picture. They'll walk off the stage. Those are the things that they're working on right now um, with regard to the diplomas. Um, on uh, April the 20, this is what the April 26th is. It is the Joint City Council School Board meeting. Is that correct, Natalie? That is the 26th. I knew something was the 26th. Uh, the 26th is the Joint City Council School Board meeting. We are at the chamber office downtown, and we are beginning at 6 o'clock. Is that um, so? Um, we'll have a couple, we have several items on there. I'll be going over the, with the agenda with Mr. Lamb. We're looking at Mayor's Youth Council. We're looking at growth in the community. We're looking at the SRO program, um, as well as IT support that Matt's team has provided for the city. Um, and the city also has different things on their agenda as well. So we'll have that out. But that is the 6th, at 6 o'clock on the 26th. Um, on May the 10th, we are having an executive session with Dr. Aziz for professional development. 
Um, that is with regard to our IDI scores and growth action plans that we talked about in the past. Um, we will have a 5.15, I think it is. What time is it? Dinner. Have we had it set yet? Dinner will be around 5.15, and that will give us about an hour and 15, 20 minutes with Dr. Aziz. Um, it will probably take that time, and it's going to be a great conversation. She's looking forward to meeting with everybody, and that's also the same day she meets with the juniors and the seniors. Um, so she'll be here in our on campus um, all day that, at that point in time. Um, on June the 3rd, uh, Culture Committee meets. Uh, we are going to meet again in person. The board, uh, you're invited. We're, we'll have an all day with Dr. Aziz that day. Um, we're going to be at the Legends um, Golf Course in their large group facility area. We will also have uh, lunch provided, dinner provided there, and then go from there. But that is on June the 3rd. Um, I just need to know if, if like, two of you are going to be there, that's fine. But if the third one comes, I have to post it as a work session, um, which is great. Like we've done in Bloomington before, we, we, we post it. Um, we are not going overnight anywhere because of COVID. It will just be a day session um, for our culture committee as we move into the next school year. So those are the things that I had to, to communicate with the board that were not agenda items. All right. Thank you. And we'll move into the next item, which is uh, public comments. Open up for anyone here in the room. Seeing none, Mrs. Betts, you have comments from online? Dr. Worland, I think this dates back to when you were talking about book rental. Mm -hmm. Barb Jankowski wanted to know if we are including headphones for each student in the rental fees, um, which would make it easier for parents. She mentioned that this could be an equity issue for those kiddos whose parents cannot afford the appropriate headphones. So she just wondered that. Mr. Sprout is coming forward. Two years ago, uh, the Department of Education required headphones for testing. And IT purchased a head set of headphones per student at each school. And we have supplemented that each year to ensure that the schools are, uh, have the he necessary headphones. And then they can use them throughout the year for any student needed. So in answer to that, no, student parents aren't paying for them, the school is. Mrs. Betts, any other comments? Okay, well, with that, we will adjourn the meeting. Thanks for your time today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.